welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a relative newcomer into the temple. One, ha one part of the double-headed monster that is Flagbearer Games, and, cre and creator of the upcoming expansion to Nations and Canons known as the American Crisis, the one and only Colin Messier. Don't call, don't call him Mockery. How you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for, thanks for coming on, and thanks for dealing with time zone bullshit. <laughs> well... You know, it, it's uh, relevant to the revolution, you know, with the, the whole time zone and mm -hmm. deciding on daylight savings time and all this other stuff. So, you know. Yeah, and a few hundred years ago, the Pope declaring that 10 days were just going to be skipped to get to help fix the Re Gregorian calendar. <laughs> yeah. So, now I, I, ha I had, I had... Um, Pat on pre previously and got hit and got his origin story. So I kind of have to get yours regarding how you first got exposed to tabletop and what made it stick. Oh wow. Okay, so I'm a second generation. Um, I started playing TTRPGs when I was like five. I mean, playing with a heavy asterisk, right? You know, I wasn't mm -hmm. really playing. Um, but I'm the the youngest, uh, and so I'd be brought in as my Dad was showing my brother how to play, um, and, you know, my dad's been playing with, like, the same group since the early 80s, I think, um, and, you know, played AD&D, &D, uh, had all the, all the additions uh, up until 3rd is when mm -hmm. uh, he stopped, so he stopped at AD&D, &D, I guess, um, and then hung out in that land for, gosh, decades before we finally converted him and his group over to 5e, uh, which I think speaks to 5e's credit <laughs> of being able to get some uh, old grognards away from uh, AD&D. Away from Thaco hell. Yeah. I mean, they, they, it might have been getting to the point where it's a little hard to calculate armor class zero and <laughs> all that other math stuff. I've always argued that... Thaco was a decent idea that was poor that was poorly explained cuz yeah. a lot of the problems that I had a lot of cuz if I if I run AD&D then yeah yeah I'm going to have issues when it comes to calculating Thaco but if I run say um Adventurer Conqueror King system or or so, or something like that uh or even um I was going to I was going to bring up Stars Without Number but that doesn't really use Thaco <laughs> um, in the same sense, but I'm not going to have the same problem. Yeah. And I mean, I... I'm definitely less familiar with them, but, uh, and it's still got nothing on like math, the game that is GURPS or, or something else. I, I have treated GURPS as my whipping boy, not because, of, not because of the quality of the game itself, but because so many GURPS adherents tell me that it's the only game that I need that I can run, <laughs> that I can run anything with it. And I'm like, yeah, if I want, if I want to break out my old TID three from, <laughs> <laughs> from fucking high school. Oh, curves. Uh, I've I don't I've always I've always said that universalist games can certainly do a lot, but it always comes with a price. Um, and if I yeah. if I wanted to ra if I wanted to raise it, I could always break I could always um break out Hero System with its six hundred pages just dedicated to character creation. <laughs> um. But to go back to your your first question, you know, been playing D and D since I was a a wee kid, um, and all throughout college. Uh, Pat, I actually met in college, and we had a a D and D group. Actually, a lot of our people that um, now make this game together, we all went to college and were playing D and D uh, and Star Wars and various other RT TTRPGs. Uh, mm -hmm. So specifically Kate, uh, Pat, obviously myself and uh, Rascal on our team at the moment. Um, though a bunch of other folks uh, like Severia will show up uh, to run events for us. And, you know, 
mostly a group of friends from college that has managed to stay keep in touch after gosh a decade um yeah. plus all the the new folks we've gained along the way and who among you would would cut would fall into the category of the forever dm uh probably pat pat was um uh definitely one of the big dms uh at when we were in college um and definitely falls into that role a lot um i think he prefers it more than most uh i i tend to not be the dm i tend to run short-lived games that uh go over really well and then i end up with some scheduling nightmare and they die <laughs> i've i have a curse in that regard but uh, me and Pat, though, have complete opposite GMing styles, um, which I think works out really nice as a creative team. Mm -hmm. Where he's very much the planner, and I'm very much the uh, respond and react uh, style. I can I can certainly get that. Now, <clears throat> when it comes to the, when it comes to the American crisis, which is as I understand it, intended to be primarily a um, a a full-on campaign for um, nations and cannons. Did this start? Did this start out as the campaign that you get that you guys were running for N for NNC and and just decide to evolve evolve it, or was there a different path to its origin? No, it it um was very intentional. It it sort of comes back to uh, I don't remember if Pat sort of told you that the why are we nnc why are we revolutionary war focused um it what it ultimately comes down to is we're all a bunch of history nerds um you know i was volunteering at Plymouth plantation when i was seven um and grew up in in that sort of that and reenacting and all that fun stuff um and pat the origin of nations and canons is very tied to a game he made for um oof <laughs> Don't get mad at me if I get the name of this wrong. Uh, the Cincinnati Historical Society, I believe, um, called Revolutionary Choices. Uh, and in making that game, Pat found a lot of uh, this art and like sort of rekindled an interest in the Revolutionary War. And then we started thinking, hey, there is a niche in 5e content that is just completely absent. And that is historical, uh, mundane historical setting. There's a lot of fantasy, there's a lot of horror, there's a lot of sci-fi, and there is butt kiss when it comes to, um, like, I want to play a historical game. People would normally go, well, then don't do 5e, do a different game setting. But if you still want to feel like a D&D &D character, this larger-than-life folk hero, D&D uh, is the perfect game for that. And I think when we're trying to market to kids and educators, which was in our original sort of mission, once we we're pulling in all this historical info. We're like, we want to help teachers um, and give kids like a gateway to being like, oh, I can, I could never relate with someone like George Washington, but um, uh, someone like a Sally St. Clair, uh, much more <laughs> down to earth and down to like, oh yeah, I could see it relating to this character and also being like inspired by what they do. Mm-hmm. Now, with with that in mind, I do remember that one of the things we definitely we talked quite a bit about when I had um, Pat on was the concept of gambits, and i I'd like to mm -hmm. I'd like to get your perspective on the on the concept. Was um was it one of those things that he that he introduced first when you guys were testing? Was it a case where you where you had where you had pitched it? Um, how did how did it end up coming about from where you were sitting? Oh gosh. Okay, so the gambits part is right about when I came on. Um, so I wasn't actually at the the sort of founding of the game. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, in its very early stages, Pat brought me on to actually make the gambits specifically. Um, and the it, so originally it was the gambits and the monsters, and then it sort of just expanded from that. 
uh, that point on to the classes and, and all the other core mechanics stuff. Um, but when it came down to it, what I was really adamant about was I wanted a system that played with regular 5e content, not replace it. So I didn't want to have a system where if you wanted to do Flintlock Fantasy in a game, um, or Supernatural, like Benjamin Franklin Banshee Slayer, an idea that would come to me much later, um, you still could do that without the game sort of falling apart or being this confusing mix of two things. Uh, and 5e spells again to 5e's credit do that pretty well so what we we did is we took mechanical concepts that you could apply in D&D and then ground them into something more mundane so that way it reinforces the setting um still in this mundane like i could see this happening but not uh but you know the i could see this happening like maybe in a John Wayne movie or um uh some other like wild west film or um errol flynn sort of mm-hmm. uh this you know big feet big flashy thing that it's like yeah that that's technically possible but maybe not very practical <laughs> or you know in a lot of cases we have historic backing of like this is something somebody did once so that means it's possible mm-hmm. and Given given that, I do I've I will admit I've been critical of of spe- of um spell charges and, and the like in D and D proper even even going all the way back to my early days, mm-hmm. but given the given the use of gambit, I'm curious how y- how you would how you would appro- how you would approach narratively a situation where somebody doesn't have has used up all has used up all of their well slots. Mhm. Yeah. Um so narratively uh a lot of the the thing that that a lot of gambits one all our gambit casters so to speak have a limited number. Mm-hmm. So this makes it a little more easier to manage than when you're dealing with like a ninth level caster with like 10 slots per day or something like that and it gets a little tricky of like well how come you can't just do one more but when it's this very limited number of resources um and a lot of them are actually require doing something before combat rather than during combat uh you end up with this sort of limited scope thing of like oh yeah you really want to keep doing you know this this tricky gambit thing but you've you've spent yourself like you're you're you haven't had enough time to prepare whatever you're going to try, or you've tried your tricks and they're they they're social gambits. Mm. Um, you're they're not going to work again. Uh, you've you've tried all the tricks up your sleeve, and now you're you're just going to have to deal with the the cards you're dealt. Um, mm-hmm. it tends to be the the tactic I take. Yeah, I can I can certainly I can certainly see that. Uh oh. It's it's okay. one it's one of those things that, it's one of those things that um that is is trick is tricky to work with because it because the whole reason the whole reason those slots are a thing is a art is an artifact from chainmail where wizards were basically artillery. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Although, How we we harken back to the chainmail. Yeah. Although um although ma- although making scatter rules for fireballs doesn't seem like a terrible idea. <laughs> oh, I I like scatter rules. We didn't incorporate them um because they get very messy at the table and I get that, but mm-hmm. we we very well might eventually have a uh optional rule somewhere. Well, you're you're dealing with weapons that while po- while certainly powerful, it would be a stretch to call them stable. <laughs> It's actually a good segue into one of the products that I don't think Pat talked to you about. Could be wrong, which is the Misfire deck. Um, um, we t- we touched we on it briefly, but since it since it's a deck, there's not a there wasn't a whole lot for me to read at the time. That was uh, when I had him on for um, Flintlocks and Fulminates. Mm-hmm. Yep. So one one of the Misfire effects for a grenade is a uh, a scatter one. 
where the grenade scatters in a random direction and we use the whole d8 grid system math yeah and i'm i'm pretty sure you i'm pretty sure you were at, or somebody else has had that situation where they where um they they do the roll for for tossing their grenade um roll, the dice gods are feeling particularly cruel that day and mm. the and they ended up getting blown up with their own grenade oh I have a great story about this of when I was running this at Gen Con. Um, and uh, it wasn't one time, it was two times. In the final battle uh, that was going on, there was one character that had two grenades. There's a great spot for them to chuck their grenade, and they're like, all right, I'll chuck one grenade. Uh, nat one uh, <laughs> blows up centered on them. Uh, they're still standing. Uh, next player's turn. Um, that player who just uh, had the explosion go off in their face is like, hey, I got another grenade. Come on over here and you can throw it. Uh, this is enough to convince that guy to come over, uh, grab the other grenade, toss it, and it's also in that one. <laughs> Clearly he had cut his fuses way too short. Um, this ends up knocking both of them unconscious. Uh, the battle's able to be resolved, and then there's a sort of heated moment of like uh, medicine checks to try to stabilize both of them as they're f continuously failing death saves, um, which of course end up resulting in that player, the one who had the grenades and throwing them, managing to recover, and the one they like encouraged to come on over, it will be fine, just grab the other grenade, uh, ended up dying. Um, and of course, this being a Firebrand character, uh, then the the story going that he restructured the story in the telling that it was <laughs> him. Uh, the grenades were being thrown at them, not uh, by them, mm -hmm. and that the other guy, like you know, jumped on the grenade to save the life of um, oh goodness, I can't remember the character's name right now. To look back up in the book. Yeah, but it's a great story, and you know, just a one of those really dynamic moments of mm. being hoist by your own petard. Yeah, I've uh, this is, I have I've told people that the that the dice gods are a model of true equality <laughs> because it does not matter your level of experience, age, gender, occupation, um per um time zone, personal preference, career, they hate you. And they want <laughs> to make you suffer. <laughs> Especially the more you care. The more you care about your dice rolls being good, the more they'll be bad. If you're you're just like someone just hanging on and just playing because you're hanging out with a group, yeah, you're probably going to have great rolls the whole night and everyone's going to be jealous. Yep. You ever hear the expression, there are no atheists in foxholes? <laughs> yes. I believe that I believe that can also apply to, to gaming tables. It's the reason why people would would scream bloody murder if you if you even touched their dice. Oh yeah, I've had players that refuse to physically touch their own dice and have to like <laughs> pick oh. up their dice with something else and then put it down a dice tower so that way they never come in contact with the dice. Well, because because my gimmick is the monk, everybody expects me to bless their dice. Ah. Uh... Which I, which I say, um, and unfortunately I get roped into it because my usual response is, I'm a monk, not a priest. And my dear friend, who is as much of a history buff as me, says, um, priests would, priest would pull double duty, monks would pull double duty as priests sometimes. You know that, right? I'm like, fuck. I can't, I can't argue with that. It's a case where he's, he's right, but I do, but I really, really, really don't want to admit it. <laughs> you just have to um, say that you're going to be the one of the monks that um, does all the oh, gosh what is that word the artistry in the, the bibles and, and copying the bible over and doing all this really fancy artwork yeah, the problem is even though even those ones would have pulled double duty as priests so I can't so I can't yeah. weasel my way out of it <laughs> oh but since you brought up the firebrand, and and since that is being added as a class within the within um within the American Crisis book, 
Mm -hmm. I'd like to go into that and and kind of get a feel for what the Firebrand's play style is intended to be. Yeah. So the Firebrand is our new class. So it's in our core book, and there's two subclasses, the Demigog and the Chaplain. Mm -hmm. um, since uh, if you're playing a, a purely mundane game, we advise not using any overtly magical classes. This eliminates your Cleric, your Bard, um, and your Paladin. Um, your sort of big support classes, um, leaving a lack of any character that can kind of fill that that nice support role or that sort of that bardy role. Um, that is uh, uh, the thing I'm doing a bad example of being good at, you know, doing the talking thing. Um, <laughs> so the demagogue one um, is your classic sort of instigator provocateur they're your son of liberty style you know rabble rousing um and mostly in it for themselves uh then your chaplain is your classic support um mm -hmm. they're you know looking out for the party looking out for the team uh m maybe more adverse to actually interacting with violence directly uh though there are uh, some great examples from history of chaplains doing uh just that mm -hmm. <laughs> um and then the new one that is coming in this book uh and this is going to seem a little weird why is it a firebrand um is the drummer subclass uh and this comes from uh actually some fans that requested like are we gonna ever you know you know what are you gonna do about drummers is that gonna be a subclass you want to do and they really wanted like a bar drummer class and we thought about it for a long time and realized that uh firebrand actually works really really well for a sort of drummer type in the battlefield uh the skeleton of firebrand has a lot of this baked in support features um something that a lot of folks don't necessarily know too in the revolutionary war drummers are still sort of following the 17th century and 16th century model rather than the 18th century so rather than drummers being you know young boys as they would be in the civil war to come um most drummers are actually coming from a, a really educated class uh some of them are like folks that are too old to fight on the battlefield um but almost all of them are multilingual uh, this is the reason why you have, like, drummers are always at peace treaty negotiations and, like, uh, all these other things, and it's because they're polyglots. Um, and that's, like, their whole jam is communication. That's what their role is on the battlefield, uh, is being able to communicate long distances. So we're real excited to bring that element into it and also have, like, another uh, support option besides the chaplain. Um Plus, they're going to have some fun tricks for long-range communication that is non-existent <laughs> during the Revolutionary War. Mm-hmm. And from what from there's also the fact that you're putting in um, six new subclass options for the co for the core entries. Now, obviously, going into detail on each of them would be a bit much, but. I'm going to correct we can at that least... number just because it does We're not doing six new ones in this book. Um, that was in our core book. So in our core book, we have six new subclasses mm -hmm. right. for the core classes. This one, we, we're just doing Jaeger as a new subclass. Yeah. So th that's my, that, is, that is my bad. I think I, I think I ended up getting my notes cross-wired. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> so... The the one that you met the one that you mentioned. What can you tell me about about that? Jaegers. So Jaegers are um, a. I mean, there's a lot of stuff to talk about with Jaegers. Where do I begin? <laughs> so our trick, one of our hardest sub or classes to make subclasses for in a mundane setting, in the Revolutionary War or really the 18th century, um, has been barbarian, because it's really confusing how to figure out how do you make a ranged focused barbarian so in our core book we had the grenadier um that was a pretty natural uh fit with how grenadiers worked in the revolutionary war being these these big tough guys doing something that uh seemed 
ridiculous. Uh, like we were just talking about before, grenades almost as likely to blow you up as the enemy. You got to be pretty uh, foolhardy to, to pick that, and that works great for uh, barbarians. With Jaeger, we're doing something a little different there. Um, and uh, I'm because it's a barbarian, uh, I'm actually less familiar with the abilities we've we've already statted out for them. Uh, I'll try to pull it up here, and actually, if we could come back, circle back to that, to what we have planned for Jaeger, because I just realized I don't actually have any of the updated notes on Jaeger. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll come back to that, and I'll tell you some things about Jaeger yeah. as we we go on. Oh. I I think what, now one of the when it comes now when it comes to the when it comes to the campaign the campaign itself what kind of level range are you going for Yeah so in this campaign uh we're we're sort of presuming you start at level 2 uh though there is an adventure in the the core book that could get you from level 2 to level 1 um so Wait did you go we... backwards <laughs> Uh, sorry, yeah, level one to level two. <laughs> um, this one is going to go from level... It, basically, each module will get you a level, so that should take you from about approximately... If you're either starting at level two or if you're being brave and starting at level one, um, uh, it will take you to about seventh level mm-hmm. by the end of it. Um, so there's five adventures we have uh, in the the module at the moment. So we'll see if that changes with stretch goals. Um, the first one is uh, the occupation of Boston and the uh, the British evacuation. So um, mm-hmm. that's that fun uh, Boston under siege moment. Uh, next up, we have Washington crossing the Delaware. Um, or if unless I'm getting the dates wrong. <laughs> Oh, and you have to keep. I think it's the the occupation of New York is is first there. Um, those two are very close together. Mm-hmm. And when you have to keep tr- when you have to keep track of so of so many different dates, I I can understand that some might get cross wired. Yeah, yeah, especially when we have both the occupation of New York and Boston under siege. Um, very different situations, but uh, similar names. And so internally in my head, I can get mixed up a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and that one you're going to hang out with uh, Nathan Hale. And um, that's actually, that's been our, of all of these adventures, that's the one we've been running at conventions for the longest, mm-hmm. um, which has had a really fun experience at the table. Um, I don't know how much you know about uh, that time or the Revolutionary War or why Nathan Hale is hanged, but Nathan Hale is executed because he thought to be, you know, he's a spy, but it's also thought that he starts this great fire of New York that happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and without fail, every time I've run this with a group of players without any prompting at all or any, uh, any prodding by me to solve any solution with fire, they inevitably... Uh, to accomplish their spycraft, um, decide that they're going to start a fire as a distraction, or they're going to throw a grenade at a very flammable chip or something like that. And inevitably, uh, I get to pull the the rug out from under them of the like, and now you know the real reason the fire happened and why Hale will be hung or hanged. Uh, Yeah. Which is a great little... uh, and now you know the rest of the the story moment. It's also it's it's also no doubt a good a good way to a good a, a good way to get to get the more destructive tendencies of pl- of players out of out of their system. <laughs> yeah. Uh, although if I although if I'm running that, I'm I'm making a rule that anybody who starts singing Billy Joel will be flogged. <laughs> Oof, yeah, that would be that would get a lot. And if 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 someone if someone thinks that that's a bit excessive, well, my philosophy is to is to make the punishment so so much worse than the crime that 
no, that um the risk is not worth it. <laughs> really, it's being like no brinkmanship here. You don't even want to get close to the line. Yeah, because I think I. It's an it's an extreme version of the whole one sword keeps another in the sheath. Mm, that makes sense. Or if I have to use the natural world, it's the reason why the most venom, why the most venomous animals in the world tend to have bright colors. Mm -hmm. As as a way as a way for other animals to say, "Stay the fuck away from me! You do not want any of this." <laughs> yeah. Oh, and the, of course, on the other hand, then you have some animals who know about that and don't care. Like, say, zebras, the ass of Africa. And I mean that both literally and figuratively. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to wonder if this is a donkey reference or not. Well, they are related to donkeys. Mm -hmm. yep. But since, it, since you unlocked it as a stretch goal, I have to ask about this. <clears throat> ben Franklin, Banshee Slayer. Oh, this is my baby. What the fuck? Yep. <laughs> Um, this is a fever dream, uh, that came out of writing the, like I alluded to before, I really wanted when making this game to make it so we weren't telling players how to play. Mm -hmm. Our game is set up. So if you want to play purely historical, you can do that. But if that's not your jam and you want to do a historical fantasy or you want to reimagine history, or you just want to have like a fantasy world where there's a bunch of people living in revolutionary war times. Um, so I had to write a sidebar about how gambits and spells work together. Um, and I, I needed a list of three. It eventually got shortened to a list of two. But uh, So I had your classic, you know, shooting a cannon at dragons, or um, I can't even remember what the middle one that we cut out was. Or, and then I just sort of sat there for a moment and was like, I don't know, Benjamin Franklin Banshee Slayer. Obviously an allusion to Abraham Lincoln Vampire Slayer. Mm -hmm. um, and then I paused, quickly Googled that, got no results, and uh, wrote it in. And uh, it's been a, a project of mine to actually push and like see if people were interested in this, this wild, wacky idea. Um it started just as a, a dumb name from a list of three, but then the more and more I looked into it, the more I kept coming up with uh, perfect module fodder of, you know, um, Ben Franklin in, is the inventor of the first American-made instrument, the glass harmonica, um, which has all this history of, like, macabre and supernatural stuff around it, like someone dying on stage... And it's this haunting melody that it sounds like, uh, made only worse by the fact that Benjamin Franklin insists repeatedly that there's nothing supernatural about it at all. Um, add into that, he writes uh, this ghost story about, as a child, about this haunted lighthouse in Boston that when, and he's at the, the, uh, siege of Boston when you know the British leave um, so the British leave and while they're leaving for some reason they set up a time bomb at this defunct lighthouse and blow it up uh, it's important to know the lighthouse wasn't actively being used for much of anything uh, and it's it set on this, this whole uh, delay timer and I'm like that's so perfect for you know, Ben Franklin just trying to blame something on the British when he's really out there hunting ghosts. Hmm. Or the bones under his basement, or all of his other weird inventions, um, habits and mannerisms. I have really fit him as the original Ghostbuster. Yeah. I have um I have jokingly referred to Fra to Franklin as the quintessential American. <laughs> in, <laughs> in 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 men in many different ways. Aside aside from the fact that he knew that he knew how he knew the best way to communicate with the French was um through the whorehouses. <laughs> I which which I'm which is one of those things I'm only half joking about. There's the whole thing of him playing of him playing ditch when it came to a um internship not in, a um apprenticeship contract that he was that he that he had signed on for and then skipped town and never came back. 
Oh, I'd say the the only other the only other person I could I could put in as far as that quintessential list, although he is the quintessential New Englander, is um, John Adams. Yeah. Who my my enduring memory of John Adams will all, will always be the time he almost he almost started a cane fight in the middle of Congress. <laughs> yeah. Because him and Hamilton, the only thing that they will ever agree on is that they hate each other. So this is why we left um, Shillelagh in as a gambit, even though it seemed a little too magical. On one hand, yes. On the other hand, Shillelaghs <laughs> are a, are a thing in in Ireland, and you do have a yeah. and you do have a whole lot of Irish in in the in the colonies. Yeah, there's a lot of Scots Irish too. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, no. the The other one I'd throw on that list is probably Ethan Allen, mm-hmm. um, who's a another really interesting uh, figure. Yeah, yeah. It's just that's some that's something I had I had to I had to br- I had to bring up um, <laughs> just just because of, just because I c- I cannot deny th- I cannot deny the ridiculousness. The other thing was um was the turtle yeah so polar opposite we have you know our our one stretch goal here that we've unlocked is for something that's kind of silly and fun instead of being historical fantasy that's you know grim dark depressing uh instead have something that's maybe a little fun to actually play Mm mm-hmm in the case of the turtle, we have uh, something that we thought would be really fun that is actually historical, and it's it's right there. We've been trying to figure out what to do with it. David Bushnell is one of our template characters. Um, and going back to that module I was talking to you about with the invasion of New York, or not invasion, the occupation of New York, um, uh, the David Bushnell develops the first submarine that is known to have been used in a combat capacity doesn't end up working at least as far as real history is concerned though in the module you get to play with that a little bit maybe um the bombing in the harbor is more successful or less successful or results in something else happening and that's that's right where we like to play in this whole getting to experience history have an effect on it and see how things play out while it's probably not going to change the course of the war um, unless your GM is going down a very different hole or you make a huge major thing um, through some very lucky die rolls. Um, And that allows you to to think about history, think about um, the world as it was then, how, how could if that b- bombing had gone off successfully, would that have changed anything? Um, the ships in Boston Harbor would, uh, you've been able to maybe rescue some notable continental, uh, prisoners that were, um, on a prison ship or instead of bombing the ship instead, like go on on a little submarine rescue mission. Mm-hmm. Like there's a lot of things you could do with the submarine that are, are really fun. And a lot of them could honestly fit, very nicely into history as it being a nice government secret that no one wanted uh, the British to know about. Yeah. So one thing that I'm curious about if, if this has ever been brought up and that is the, that is the notion of Hessians, um, German mercenaries that were, that were, that were technically on the, on the loyalist side, but I wouldn't be surprised if some, if some decide to switch, decide to switch during yeah. the war. Uh, so there is some, uh, so one of our template characters actually is, I believe, a Hessian. He certainly would have been called a Hessian by the Americans. I just can't remember if he's from Hessel or one of the the two provinces that make up the Hessians Mm -hmm. in Germany, because Germany during this time period is, of course, uh, a complicated, uh, period. But, um, oh no, he's a Dutch immigrant. Mm-hmm. Uh, not sure. uh, there are a few examples of them uh, switching over. I know there was someone that came up to me that was an expert on 
on Hessians and I think had a relative that had ended up going over to the Patriots side and was telling me a story. Um, the Hessians are one of the, are a group of people that I think have been done a massive disservice in the telling of the Revolutionary War because they're always sort of described as, you know, drunk or um, incompetent and all this other thing, which is just so far from the truth. Um, uh, in, in the crossing of the Delaware module, uh, there'll be a lot of dealings with Hessians obviously because they're the the main uh combatants there um also it will be the sort of first introduction to the villain of this campaign book um that is a hessian himself uh though originally he dies at the battle of red bank um uh colonel i believe at the time von donup uh is going to be a, a big figure in this new book and yeah. turns out at least in our story, he didn't die. At least not yet. Uh, it turns out your friend is only mostly dead. <laughs> Look, someone was going to say it, so it may as well be me. <laughs> yeah. But um, a big reason why I asked about about the level range when it comes to when it comes to the American crisis is you've probably seen this as well. There's been this narrative that um D and D is bo- is boring once you get past tenth level. Yeah. Um, and it's it's one of those th- it's one of those things where I can see where people say it, but I think there's a f- I think there's a few asterisks as to why because just saying just saying that it's boring at tenth level doesn't fully encompass the issue. Um, I'd s- the bigger issue is lack of support. You know because there's so much hyper focus on the new player experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I let, it's kind of the opposite to the problem that World of Warcraft has where it, where there's so, mu- there's so much focus on the world-first crowd with raids that you end up making raids that are f- have far too high of a floor for everybody else. Mm-hmm. Um. So I'm cu- I'm curious if you if you've had any have have in, have had any um times where you've actually managed to get as high as the mid mid to high teens or even level twenty, um running nations and cannons or even being a player. So with nations and cannons, we do we did add an optional rule for retiring characters at tenth. Um, the and the main reason for this is that tenth level characters are above tenth level characters. Do you end up starting to break the simulation of reality a little bit. Um, with that being said, um, we actually have a pretty good solution to dealing with higher level parties um, and having combat scale really well. So in all our modules, there's a whole, um, you know, if your party is too strong for the encounter or too weak, there's notes on how to, to change it to make that fit. Um, and the sort of easiest option is just add more footmen. Um, unlike in core D and D where you're, you know, your basic goblin or your, uh, orc or what, what have you, um, to a higher level party is just going to be kind of irrelevant. They don't, they're not really concerned about them at all. Um, in our game, because, uh, because of the bounding, the way bounded accuracy works, the fact that all guns do a lot of damage uh, in that they have the option to do volley fires with the support of sergeants and officers end up resulting in this um, scalar problem. Also the, uh, oh, I'm a 11th level or I'm a 12th level character. Single-handedly, there's no one in this city that should be able to oppose me. So I'm God here. Well, if your basic soldier is a footman, yeah, no. Even even a tenth level par- or a twelfth level character is going to be taken down. They'll take down a lot of footmen in the process, but um, just the the overwhelming fire that's going to end up being shot at them is going to going to end them pretty quickly. If you fire enough bullets, eventually you will hit something. Yeah. Oh. Plus, you yeah. know, they shoot a cannon at you. Okay, <laughs> what are you going to do? Yeah. 
I had I have considered in the in the past treating characters who are, who are who are past tenth level as the equivalent of um of Doppelsoldners during the Hundred Years War. I'm not familiar. Um, Doppelsoldner, it's bas it basically means double pay. They were oh the, okay. Obviously, it's building off of the concept of the Landschnecht, which were the which were mm -hmm. those um. German mercenaries that tended to wear tend to wear outfits that, no matter what the era, would be considered ridiculous, especially cod pieces <laughs> that don't even that aren't even trying to be subtle. <laughs> <laughs> but the mindset is that they that they're usually doing the doing the most dangerous jobs, so mm -hmm. they'd get double pay. But of course, you're only getting paid if you come back. <laughs> yeah. And I could see you. I could see utilizing tenth, tenth level plus characters as a case of okay, you've done you've done your part with the grunt work. Now you get to do the real dangerous stuff, the stuff where you, yeah. per, where um, any other per, any other person would call it suicidal. But <laughs> you've been doing this enough. You've been doing this enough. You know what you're you know what you're doing. Yeah, I mean even at low levels, that's kind of how we our our default narrative these the players as these sort of they're not necessarily we don't like even in the module your characters aren't forced to be soldiers you're working for the continental army uh, that doesn't mean you hold rank that doesn't mean you're um, actually signed on or anything like that uh, because you're being hired to do more discreet uh, asymmetrical warfare spycraft style stuff mm -hmm. that you know if you get caught, the Continental Army doesn't really even want you to be trace backable to them. They maybe want a little bit of like, oh no, I have no idea. That person was just acting on their own, clearly. That's mm -hmm. definitely not a spy. Um, yeah. And that that's kind of the, the whole like fun of D&D, &D, right? Is you're playing this larger than life character. Um already even at low levels you you stand out from your common soldier as this eccentric weirdo <laughs> that is more capable of taking on a a like you said potentially suicidal mission like going behind enemy lines or something yeah at oddly enough the film that i end up using a, a lot when it comes to setting up the party as at least in at least in terms of an influence and I'm t I'm technically cheating because this isn't a revolutionary war story, but it's a story that I think can fit, to, mm -hmm. to in a roundabout way. Inglorious Bastards. Oh yeah, I can see Inglorious Bastards working. I, I use well, that and um, and so, and the general idea of Battlefield Bad Company. The, I'm not familiar with that one, but the cent yeah. the central idea I try I try and go with is um. The is that the part the party is is are members of the Continental Army, but they are the outcasts, the misfits, the guys who, the guys who, for one reason or another, ended up ended up getting in trouble. So they got so they got stuck in the they got stuck in in doing the work that even the even the frontliners don't want to do. Mm -hmm. Most mostly because mostly because because they've. Because the thing, the thing I would always tell people is, okay, you got your, you got yourself in trouble with with the higher ups for one reason or another. I want all of you to f to figure out something that you did, whether it was getting into a fight, getting too drunk, mouthing off, you know, some something along those lines that got that got you in so much trouble that you ended up getting relegated to the, to the hellhole part of the army. Mm hmm. Since. Well, it's, it's not like it's not like you're dealing with with full on pro, with full on prof professional soldiers. You're dealing. It's a case of anybody who wants to anybody who wants to fight for fight for this fight for independence and can and can shoot with a gun. Um, you're in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which, on one hand, can result can result in ver can result in very people who know how to shoot. On the other hand, can result in um, people who know people who know how to shoot but not necessarily how to hit. Yeah. You know, yeah. There's always going I mean, to be an element. Of, yeah, there's there's always <laughs> going to be an element of chaos. So instead of trying to fight it, embrace it. 
Yeah. I mean, that's what D and D is, right? Well, it's what it it's what it ends up being. It's not what it even though it tries to pretend otherwise. <laughs> like it tries to pretend that you're going on you're going on this epic que- you're going on this epic quest as this he- as this he as this hero, but we all know how it really ends up hap- going down. Everybody starts thinking that starts thinking out that they're that they're doing Lord of the Rings, and then they inevitably end up doing Holy Grail. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, by the way, I did pull up the the notes that we had for uh, Jaeger. All right, uh, Path of the Jaeger. Mm-hmm. Uh, so our our principal idea is sort of similar to um, the way that totem barbarian works where they have these different picks Mm -hmm. um uh so you pick different uh instincts um that you learn as you gain levels and these have different effects um that sort of represent your um weird like living in the the hinterlands style of um how jaegers operate as these sort of special wilderness op- operatives mm-hmm. um and you know using short range uh weapons like uh, fusel carbines and um uh fowlers and all all sorts of other uh weapons that often are used uh, for getting in close in sort of dense terrain mm-hmm which is which is appropriate since Jaeger literally translates to hunter. Yeah, exactly. So, would it be fair? So this is based. <clears throat> this is basically for those who want to do the ranger thing, but don't want to, don't want to, co- don't want to cover themselves in le- in leaves, or <laughs> or do, or do or have some of the trappings that end up causing the ranger to be th- to be the um whip the whipping boy for bad class design yeah yeah no there's in this case you're um you're playing a little differently than a normal barbarian because you gain at third level an ability um that doesn't force your rage to end if you don't attack allowing you to um be sort of a little more sneaky about like raging getting into cover and then attacking after you reload or something like that mm-hmm. uh, and that's been you know we're, we're still playing with a couple of these abilities here we we've uh, released um a version of it i think to our patreon supporters i don't think we've po- pat's posted this to reddit uh, he might have posted this one to reddit mm-hmm which is 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 fairly well fair. Mm-hmm. So with now with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a page count for the American Crisis? Oh boy, that's a pat question. <laughs> yeah. um, I know we have it written down somewhere, but I do not know that number off the top of my head. Um, I think it's going to be actually it might even be slightly longer than our our core book just because of the way uh, modules end up working out and the fact that the other thing that's in there is the Colonial Gazette. Um, I could be wrong, but I believe our page count was closer to the 180s. Um, but that please take that with a grain of salt of the the person that <laughs> is is often less interested when it comes to how many pages exactly are we talking about? I are... prefer the much more fluid, it'll be as many pages as it is. Um, but on one hand, I can understand that. On the other hand, um, I've seen, I I have seen, I have seen, I've seen where that story ends. If, if, if it isn't kept in check. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. It ends up that this is why Pat and me make a really good pair. So, in other words, one of you is Abbott and the other one is Costello? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I forget which one is which in terms of that dynamic, but uh, that's definitely been our sort of writing style. Is um, uh, Pat is the, the sort of more vigilant um, and, and lawful party member, and I'm the, the, the chaotic en- en- uh, entry. 
Oh no. Which leads me to leads me to ask one important question. Who's the tank? Hmm. Uh, probably our graphic designer, Adri. No, who's the tank? Who's the tank? Yeah, it'd be our graphic designer. No, who is the tank? <laughs> I'm this. Uh, the, the question's going over my head. Sorry. Have you ever? Have you never heard who's on first? <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay, yes, absolutely. I just. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> I thought you meant, meant like on our team who's the tank and I just had to give a shout out to our graphic designer because she does such a good job and puts up with our shit I mean Where we're constantly was... being like do this no do that no do this no do that there was there was certainly that and if I, if I was if I was in a room with the graphic designer I'd, prob I'd probably hand her a sandwich just just in <laughs> case just in case because I do that She'd with the I do that. that with the I with the IT crowd and at um at my work, just on the off chance that one of them decides to go nuts that day, they'll remember that I was nice enough and gave and gave and made them a, and made them a Reuben, and they won't go after me. <laughs> yeah. Um. But what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Are you thinking sometime in the fall for the PDF, or is it going to be a little bit earlier? Um, right now, our, our official stance is we, we're doing the full year of, um, release. Um, with that being said, it's going to be sooner. We just want to cover our asses and not promise over promise since this is a side gig for all of us. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and what we have learned in writing historical modules is they take so much more time than writing, um, a module where if you need a scene to have a little more drama you can just throw a dragon in and don't you don't have to worry about why that dragon's there or if it makes sense um uh or you know were there even that many troops in the battle sort of um uh, nonsense that uh we end up doing with that being said the modules piece of it is actually uh almost complete um we just want to go through uh a, a nice period where we bring all the modules we've written together and mm -hmm. actually, you know, uh, close ranks between them. So that way, you know, fixing any inconsistencies between them, uh, add a little more interplay between the different modules since they've all been written independently. Mm -hmm. Um, so we could write them all at the same time. Uh, and then our, our big road blocker, uh, one of our modules that we want to do, uh, is where we've been sort of calling breaking the Confederacy. And that deals with um, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy breaking down, uh, not a, with the exclusive cause of, but uh, with the revolution being one of the factors in breaking down relations specifically between the Oneida and uh, the Mohawk. Mm -hmm. um, now, to write that module, we have some indigenous writers on our team, but we don't have anyone with Haudenosaunee cultural sensitivity. So we've been tracking down someone who can write a module for that. So if any of your listeners know any Haudenosaunee, specifically Mohawk or Oneida um, uh, folks that might be interested in writing or partnering um, with some other indigenous designers on writing that module, that would be a huge help. That is, at least in my mind, my biggest concern about um, hitting our deadline. Yeah. Well, with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the time zone hell to come all the way <laughs> to my temple. Yeah. Oh, and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I've often said around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Love it. Thanks. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>